Rome, the Senate floor, circa 152 BC. One of the Republic's most senior politicians draws a fiery speech to a close. He demands that the African port city of Carthage, formerly Rome's greatest foe, but now a shadow of its old self, be raised once and for all. Carthage must be destroyed. His supporters cheer as he finishes, but the floor falls silent as another man, equally respected, stands. No, Carthage must be spared. Hello, welcome to Second Hand History, where I will discuss the grand, sweeping implications of neglected portions of history, and my friend here Egghead will... iron out any minor oversights. The focus of today's video is a certain Roman statesman, Publius Cornelius Scipio Nesica Corculum. We'll call him Scipio Nesica. Born around 206 BC, Scipio Nesica isn't exactly a household name today, but in his time, he was among the Roman Republic's most respected politicians. The man had a lot going for him. A member of the gens or clan Cornelia, Scipio Nesica hailed from Rome's most esteemed patrician lineage and was related to many of the Republic's greatest heroes, including the famed general. Scipio Africanus. He was intelligent, the last part of his name, Corculum, being a nickname meaning cunning. He won his first recorded elected position at the age of 37. A year later, he served with distinction in Rome's ongoing war with the Kingdom of Macedon. Twice elected consul, and once as Rome's chief priest, Scipio Nesica built a reputation as a champion of traditional Roman virtues, such as demolishing the city's first permanent stone theater. He said it would promote idleness. But for all his accomplishments, his most prominent political fight was one of his last. In the mid-2nd century BC, Rome's attention increasingly turned back to an old foe, the African trading port of Carthage. A century earlier, the cities were arch-rivals and had fought two grueling wars for regional dominance. The second of these wars saw the legendary Carthaginian general Hannibal Barca cross the Alps with elephants, ravage Rome's countryside, and smash multiple Roman armies larger than his own, but the Romans eventually managed to box him into southern Italy, while another legion led by Scipio Africanus drove Carthaginian forces from Hispania. Scipio Africanus then invaded Africa to force Hannibal to come to Carthage's defense, and finally defeated him at the Battle of Zama. Carthage surrendered. The harsh peace terms that Rome imposed stripped Carthage of its power and tried to permanently cripple its economy, but while Carthage never recovered militarily, as decades passed and the last indemnities were paid, its prosperity returned. For many Romans who still bore a grudge, this was unacceptable. Their proposed solution? Burn Carthage to the ground! Leading this movement was one of the other big names in Roman politics, Marcus Porcius Cato, or Cato the Censor. Born in 234 BC to a plebeian family, Cato had actually fought in the Second Punic War and worked his way up the ranks while that blue-blood Scipio Nesica was still a kid. He was austere, hard-working, old-fashioned in taste, and as it turned out, very long-lived. But while it's always risky to judge ancient leaders by modern standards, if Nesica leaned traditionalist, Cato was, well, a downright bigot. He railed against what meager rights women had gained since the Republic's creation. He railed against quote-unquote effeminate Greek philosophy, but most of all, he railed against Carthage. As long as that city stood, Cato argued, Carthage would be an affront to Rome's glory and a potential future threat. He would hold up a fresh African fig 
to remind the listeners just how close Carthage sat geographically to the Republic's heart, disregarding both Carthage's hollowed out military and the fact that Romans knew how to cultivate African figs in Italy. Cato would reportedly end every speech with the same words. Furthermore, Carthage must be destroyed. But there was a problem. Despite all the bluster, Carthage had done nothing wrong to justify war. Whatever they felt about Carthage, Nasica and other Romans traditionally prided themselves as an honorable people. No, that didn't mean that they saw war as an unfortunate but necessary evil to be engaged as a last resort, far from it, nor did it mean that they would always spare civilians and never enslave non-combatants. But it did mean that Rome always wanted to see its wars as having some kind of just cause, or at least a believable pretense. As self-serving as this characterization was, there was some truth to it. As recently as 171 BC, the Senate had annulled the conquest of the Greek city of Abdera, declaring it an unjust war and freeing all the captives enslaved by the Roman praetor Hortensius. Rome's premium on military glory meant it was always itching for a fight, but their sense of honor meant that they had to convince themselves that it was more than just some opportunistic blood orgy. And so the political battle lines were drawn. Whenever Cato declared that Carthage must be destroyed, Scipio Nasica would retort in mirror-like manner that Carthage must be spared. As compelling as it may have felt, he argued, Simply satisfying an old grudge was not a sufficient justification for war, even by the flexible standards of the time. In fact, ever since their last defeat, Carthage routinely went out of its way not to antagonize Rome. Going to war in this context would not only stain Roman honor in itself, it would damage the Republic's standing as a reputable player on the international scene. Finally, Nasica warned that Romans needed Carthage as a counterweight of fear. According to him, Rome's immense rise in power and wealth brought with it the growing risk of its citizens losing critical civic virtues. Keeping Carthage around to remind them of the threats Rome once faced would help preserve the vigilance and discipline their system needed to withstand changing times. By contrast, Destroying Carthage would trigger a moral rot that would eventually undermine the Republic's very foundation. Exactly how this clash played out between these two titans of Roman politics is vague and varies from source to source, but at some point, in some form, the Senate took a vote. The results came in. Scipio Nasica's stance had won the day. Although warnings about Rome's moral foundation or whatever were a dime a dozen then, the Senate did care about its diplomatic standing. Even though Rome was arguably the Mediterranean's preeminent military power by this point, its influence overseas still heavily depended on a network of client states and local allies, some of whom already inwardly questioned the benevolence of the Latin-speaking newcomers. And there were still other trading partners and neutral powers who would be watching the Republic's conduct from afar. For now, no war. But Cato's pro-war faction wasn't about to give up. They would keep this topic on the forefront as long as necessary. Please like and subscribe, and join us for part two, when events in Africa give Cato the pretense he's looking for.